Good morning, folks. I'm just going to do a couple of teachings on the beginnings, right back from the beginning in Genesis, but particularly for new Christians, but for all of us Christians, in, in where did sin originate? And how did it originate? What happened? And, um, and why it happened? And, and uh, what way? We're going to concentrate on initially just build some groundwork in Genesis 1. We're going to concentrate this week on the creation of man and um, then the temptation of the enemy, Satan, um, in the garden called the serpent. And look at that. And next week we'll get into the consequences of that. And um, it might take a couple of weeks to get, a couple of sessions to get through all this. Um, you will be aware that my dogs are in the background and they might make a bit of noise. Oh, and uh, But we hope they'll, they'll keep quiet for a while. Sometimes I'll be quiet for hours and other times they won't be quiet at all. Then we'll try and get through this. And and I pray that, that each one of us would be um, encouraged by the word of God, give us understanding because the the whole bible pivots around genesis chapter 3 um, of course is the creation what happened in creation is very important to us that god created there wasn't any evolution that god created mankind in his image that it was all good until we get to chapter 3 when we see the serpent into the garden man eve was tempted then and and, and and there was the fall and that chapter three really sets the groundwork for all the doctrine and the building of the of and of course this is why Jesus came into the world, why we needed a savior in the first place. And we'll see that in the garden there was no death before Adam. Through the sin of Adam, maybe of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, death entered into mankind. And we'll look at those scriptures and we'll concentrate mainly in Genesis. We'll look at scriptures elsewhere in the Bible to to um, to validate uh, those things. And I do pray and ask, Lord, that um, you would give us insight and understanding by your spirit as we look into this in Jesus' name. So I'll be sharing my screen. I'll, of course, I use the New King James Version most of the time. We will be looking at the scriptures. I'll, I'll be using a Word document with the scriptures already there. We'll be working through that document. But feel free to write the scriptures down and to validate the scriptures that what I have there is correct because that's what we should do. We should be researching these things for ourselves as well. So let's get started. And of course, is the very beginning is, is in the garden. And um, we read there in, in first of all from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, some people teach that, that there that there was the earth was without form and void was like something had happened and made it like that. No, this is, was a blank canvas, a blank canvas which God was going to work from, and where the Spirit of God was hovering over the face, the Spirit of God was waiting and looking forward to see what God was going to do like, say, Van Gogh or some great famous painting or artist would have a, a blank canvas. That blank canvas hasn't got a painting on it, but there's nothing wrong with that blank canvas. It just hasn't been worked on, hasn't been finished. And, of course, so if somebody was there watching, they'd be waiting and with anticipation to what that great painter was going to paint. And here we have the, the Holy Spirit hovering there to see the great work that God was going to do. And, of course, as we see that the God created... We will see that God spoke as we, as you read through Genesis chapter one. You see God spoke. God said, "Let there be light." God said, "Let the night and the day be divided." God said it was His spoken word that brought forth creation. It wasn't a big bang. There is no evolution. Evolution did not exist. It, it is a lie from really the pit, lie from the devil. And of course, as evolution wants to is a is a whole thing to tear man away from God. Because with evolution, God doesn't exist. But also the sad part about evolution is there is no need of a saviour and there is no reason for life. You just happen to be. Whereas God created man because he wanted man. And of course, as we have a hope of eternity with God, our creator. 
So again, we're just going to jump a few verses through the actual creation. We're going to come part with God in day six. Now, it's really day six we're concentrating on. So we read in Genesis 1, verse 26 to 29, And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw it was good. And as it was good, evolution continues to have death right through it. As things evolve, there's constant death. Death isn't good. Here God says it's good. Verse 26, chapter 1 in Genesis. Then God said, let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Notice that word dominion over all things. So creation, man was created to have dominion over the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now here we see that man was created in God's image. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God saw that, saw that all he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening and there was morning of the sixth day. Again, we see God saw it was very good. Evolution was tell us that man evolved over a period of time, and of course, that involved death. And of course, there's nothing very good there. And God created, it says God created. There wasn't a period of time where things were progressing. God said, let us make man, and God made man. It's no evolutionary process here. It was the word of God, and we'll find that in, in chapter 2, that God formed man from the dust of the ground. And, of course, the difference is here that where all the other creatures are created, but mankind was created in the image of God. So, and also, we, then we go on to, that's, so the last verse there, and God said it was very good in, in verse 31 of chapter 1, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Not just good, but very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day, in the first verse of chapter 7. And of course, there's an example to us to, about resting and God. And it says the first, in, in, in Genesis there, it's in, chap, in, in chapter 2, it says, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his works, which he had created and made. Okay, so, so the Sabbath was created for man to have a rest. We weren't created to, to work seven days a week, day in, day out. God wants us to rest and have a day of rest. And so God instituted that right there at creation, rest. Okay, so then we read in verse 4, yeah, and this is an account of the heavens and the earth when they created day the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Now again we say chapter 2 is not a second creation. Some people think it's saying something different but it's actually a summary of what good God did in chapter 1 and it specifically drills down into detail on the day 6. So let's have a look at that. Okay, so before any plant of the field, this is chapter Genesis 2, 5 to 17. Before any plant of the field was created and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But the mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. So we see there's mist on the earth, there's no rain. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now that's interesting there too, that all the other animals God created and they lived and they became a living being from his word. But here it says he formed us from the ground, like a potter would mould a, a pot on a, on a wheel, take a lump of clay, which is basically dirt, and make it into something. So God did the same here. And then something special, God breathed into him and, and he gave him life. So we have the breath of God breathed into us and each of us being made in the image of God. Unlike the animals, they were just created alive, ready to go. God didn't breathe individually into them, only into mankind. So mankind is special. We are different and separate from all of the other created order in, in terms of animals and fish and birds, lizards and everything else. 
God created us in his image. And he also breathed his life, his breath, into us and gave us life. Okay. So then we get down to, oh, sorry, we're still there in the middle. And the Lord God formed man is in, so in verse 8, sorry. And the Lord God planted a garden in eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And we'll jump down to verse 9. And out of the ground God made every tree that grows, that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out to the garden, and the tree of knowledge for good and evil. That's no, sorry, I looked at it. Sorry, verse 10. Now a tree sorry. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from where it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that skirts the whole land of Halava, where there is gold. And the gold of the land is good. The Dalim and Onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hidikalai. Kalel. It is the one which goes towards the east of Syria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may eat. Now, let's just stop. First of all, these rivers it's naming here don't exist today. Even though we have a, call, a river called the Euphrates, this was in the land before the flood. Now, after the flood, when Noah and that got out of the ark, they named rivers probably the same as what they'd known before. But this was before the flood. So none of this land, the Garden of Eden, does not exist today. And these rivers named here don't exist today. Now, it's very important we look here and highlight those words. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, now it's very important here, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Every tree. Now, these are the words of God spoke to Adam, every tree and freely. That's important. Some versions have the word any of any tree instead of every, and it means the same thing. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. These instructions were spoken to Adam, not to Eve. The only restriction placed on man was not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But he had the rest of the garden, all of the garden of Eden, to eat from every or any tree he so designed he could eat freely. He could eat as much as he want, wanted to. Now, God put him in the garden also, gave him work to tend the garden, to look after it. But he could eat any and every tree as much as he want, every tree, freely. It means there was no restrictions on what he could or not could do or how much he could eat from those trees, except the one tree, only one thing, only not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there was, what a job description, only one. You know, look after the garden, have all those trees, eat what you want, don't eat one tree. Don't eat one tree, only one. Now, of course, as we know that, um, that Eve as yet hadn't been created. Okay, so it's, it's after that we see the creation of Eve in Genesis 2, 18 to 25. And the Lord God said, it is not good for the man, which is Adam, that he should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air. So this, again, as I said, is a, a um, summary of what he had done in chapter 1. And he brought them to Adam to see what he'd call them. So he brings all the animals to Adam, and whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So, Adam, so we again see here... But there is nothing like Adam. All the animals were brought forth or brought to Adam by God. He named those animals, but there was nothing comparable to him. Why? Because Adam was created in God's image and also God breathed life into him. No other animal had that. And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord had taken from the man, from Adam, he made into a woman, okay, and he brought her to the man, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. 
Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. So that's important here. That, that that's verse is put there for a reason, as we'll see later. So they were naked, but they were not ashamed. I believe they actually have a covering, a spiritual covering from God, placed upon them. And of course, is because and there was perfection there. And we'll find that they also walked with God on a regular basis. They had relationship with God that, that really we can only dream of and we will one day have that relationship when we meet God in heaven or we when we if we're caught up in the rapture and we live in the millennium and then in, in the eternity we'll have that type of relationship with God but that was lost in chapter 30 we'll get to there and the relationship with with God through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and as we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior has been restored. We can go into the holy place. We can go boldly before the throne of God. We can pray directly to God. We are called kings and priests, or the kingdom and priests of God. But that relationship that Adam and Eve had of walking with God will be restored in the millennium and in, when we go to be with God in eternity. Because at the moment, I think if we walk directly into the presence of God, we probably would not survive very long. And we see in the Old Testament when, when different prophets had a vision of God, also the angel of the Lord, often they were very scared for their life, that they would, um, would die because they had actually just witnessed God. So yes, the relationship that Adam and Eve had with God was lost in the garden. We'll read more about that later in the, in the next um, sessions. Jesus has restored that relationship. We can come to God. We can pray. We can come into the presence of God and be, and even the Spirit of God inhabits us. And we, you know, we are filled with the Spirit when we become a Christian, receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But that relationship of walking with God will be restored in totality when we go to be with Him. Okay, so of course is God created male and female. Eve was the same DNA as Adam because she was made from Adam. Now, again, I want to emphasize the fact is that Adam was made first. God has set an order here. God created Adam first, the male. He then showed Adam that no animals are any good for him. And then he brings the female to him and... Oh, sorry, he puts him, because nothing was found was, was good enough. He then puts him to sleep, takes a rib, makes the female, and then Adam wakes up, of course. Oh, the first um, um, you know, the first time a man person was put to sleep, the first operation, and he was brought to man, and, of course, he called her woman because she was taken out of a man. All right, now we're moving into the pivotal, ch the pivotal chapter and really what the whole doctrine of salvation and why we need a saviour is built upon. And we need to understand this because so many people struggle in their faith, I believe. One of the reasons is that they don't have the foundations in Genesis. And there are some people that teach we don't even need to read the Old Testament. Well, how do you understand why Jesus came and the need for a saviour unless you understand what happened in the Old Testament, and particularly here in Genesis? we're introduced to something here other than just the man and the woman. It says now in Genesis 3, 1, 24, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And, and he said to the woman, so the serpent here, it's a cunning thing. It's a part of creation. What's happening? The creation is talking to the woman. Now, of course, as remember in verse in, in chapter one, man was told to have dominion over creation, and we see a, a, a conflict here. Something's happening that is already that this is out of God's order. And the serpent says to the woman, Has God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now I've got that highlighted there because that's important. He, the, he said the, the, the has God said. You shall not eat of every tree. That's, a, that's not what God said. Anyway, let's have a look at something. Who is the serpent? 
Okay, we need to let the Bible interpret itself. And we find this the answer in Revelation, two, two spaces, but I've just got one here. So Revelation 12, verse 9, it says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels cast out with him. We see here the serpent is also called the devil or Satan. Something else is happening here. In, here. Creation is being corrupted. Man was created to rule over creation. But here we see him listening to creation, a serpent. And of course, but that's not what God said. Now the serpent said, here, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. But we read under that, well, God said in 2.16, oh, of every tree of the garden, you may eat, you may freely eat. The serpent says, you shall not eat of every tree. That's what God said. No, God said you can eat every tree and freely. So the serpent here has, has taken away from God's word and he's twisting God's word. So you see, do you see the twisting of God's word and questioning what God has said, creating doubt, making it out as if God is holding something back from them. Resentment starts to build. The strategies used here by Satan are the same ones he uses today. Number one, adding to or twisting God's word. And number two, he attacks the goodness of God. It's as if God's holding something back and he's attacking God's goodness. And we, we that's happening all the time. The goodness of God is being questioned on a regular basis. And as we see that, that's not what God said. Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. And of course, as God said, every and freely. And of course, now let's have a look at the woman's response in Genesis chapter 3, verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Notice she left out every and freely. She was not there when the directions were given to Adam, as we've already established, because that was given before Eve was created. And we're going to ask the question, did he properly pass on the information? We need to be careful ourselves. We need to be always be careful to be reading and quoting the whole scripture and also in context. Okay. And then, of course, she adds this here, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it. Yes, God said that. And then she adds this, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Here she left out the word, she's left out the word every and freely. She's taken away from the word of God. That was mistake number one. And she adds to the word of God, you shall not touch it, mistake number two. Now this is a form of legalism, building rules around God's command. And she starts to buy into the deception, mistake three. And legalism is when we take uh, take something and and build a fence around it. And the analogy, it's, it's what it is, is, there's, is God gives a rule, and of course we don't want to make that rule, so we make another rule so that we don't touch that rule. And it's a bit, the analogy I often use is like, I travel in the mountains a lot and do a lot of forward driving, and there's a lot of places I've seen a change over the years where you would go to these lookouts over a valley and there's a cliff there, and it would have a sign up. Initially when I go, there was no sign. So it was, you just knew if you're walking at the edge of the cliff, it was dangerous. But then there were signs put there, don't go to cliff edge, you could fall, you could die if you fall off that cliff. And the sign was put there. But then you go back several years later and you find no longer there's just not the sign, but they've now built a fence. A fence there to stop you getting to the edge because people didn't believe the sign and went to the edge. Now, maybe somebody fell off, maybe they didn't, but certainly in places people have fallen off cliffs because they haven't listened to the sign. And in fact, is even today we hear people have fallen off the cliff and they've actually gone over the fence. So, so even though they, there was a secondary boundary or secondary rule put there, here's the fence. You don't go past the fence. And that's what legalism does. Legalism continues to build more rules upon more rules to stop you touching the false first rule. And, of course, that's where Jesus had so much trouble with the Pharisees was because they kept building rules upon rules upon rules, and they became more important than the original rule of God, particularly around the Sabbath. And you see Jesus having confrontational confrontations with the Pharisees regularly over the Sabbath because the Pharisees have built a whole heap of rules around the Sabbath, which was not God's originally original rule or not what God originally intended. 
And so we see that. So, so we read in Revelation that we're not to add to Scripture. Revelation 22, 18 says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues of the written book. If anyone takes away of the words of this book of the prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life. So we're, and from the holy city which read this book. So it's referring to Revelation, but I believe that refers to the whole Bible. We don't add to the Bible our own words and we don't, Take away from the words of Scripture. You can make a verse say anything you want if you add something and take away something, but it's no longer the Word of God. It then becomes the Word of man. And it's deceptive and lying. So we ask the question now. We see the serpent talking to Eve. Where's Adam? Eve's answered the serpent, and we see that there she got it wrong. She left out words every and freely, and added words, you should not touch it. Gee, God never said you can't touch it. Now, what about Adam? Where is he? Isn't he the head of the family? Where was Eve when God gave the command in Genesis 2.16? She was not there, in fact, because she hadn't even been created at this time. And God, Eve's creation occurs in verse 22, after the animals were brought to eat, Adam. This command was given to Adam, 2, 16 and 17, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat, you will die. God had a created order for a reason. Eve was created after this. Did Adam take his place as the leader of the head of the home? Did he faithfully teach these commandments to Eve, his wife? It would appear not. Either Eve's totally forgotten, or Adam never taught it properly to her. Here is Eve floundering around. Why didn't Adam step in? Why didn't he step into the situation and take the leadership? He was being passive, and sadly, as many husbands and fathers are today, many men are, this is, okay, so this is mistake number four. Adam not taking his rightful place of headship, and Satan the devil saw this crack and exploited it. So we see here in verse four, then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For the Lord God, you know, in the day you eat it, of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. What a total lie. He's now not just twisting God's word, he's actually out and out lying. He's out and out cutting away from God's word, challenging God directly, and also accusing that God's keeping something from Eve. God's not giving you all that you should have. God's keeping something from you. And of course, Eve then begins to doubt in a heart, in a who she is, the word of God. She begin, begins to think that God is holding something back from her, listening to the serpent. Again, where was Adam? And we see this, this distortion here is that Adam and Eve were told to, together. Now, remember, this was together. Adam and Eve were given dominion over the world. Adam was the head. Eve was in the second. God was over Adam. We see in, in Ephesians that Christ is over the man. But we see here a distortion where, and this is, was the, how Satan wanted to work it, God created man to have dominion. The enemy comes into a serpent, and now we see the serpent having a form of leadership and dictating or talking to the woman and telling the woman what she should or shouldn't do, and also saying that the creator is lying. Now we see here the serpent said to, to the woman, you should not surely die, for God knows in the day you eat. So God calls, the serpent calls God a liar, diminishes God's word, he takes away from God's word, and the God was holding. So there's part of the, he, he diminishes God's word, he takes away from God's word, and um, so we see this, uh, there's a third strategy here, he subtracts from God's word because he knows the promises of God. So the word says, the word of God is living and active and it's powerful. And of course, it says in Isaiah 55 that it's powerful. And of course, he says that when it is proclaimed, it does not return void. Promise after promise after promise. Do you think Satan wants you to be blessed in that sense? Of course not. He wants you to be distracted. He doesn't want you to know the word of God the full word of God, the full counsel of God.
Don't you see the fourth strategy really of the enemy is promising wisdom outside of submission to God. Verse 5 there says, For God knows that that day your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You can be wise, Satan says, without submission to God. In fact, you'll be like God. I can give it all to you, Adam and Eve. What a great deception is occurring here. This is the very thing that Satan himself did. We talk, we see in Isaiah where Satan says, I will be like the Most High God. Proverbs 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Adam and Eve here were becoming fools. And so are we if we listen and try to gain knowledge and wisdom from other sources. People all over the world are seeking other sources, gurus and all sorts of things. And the occult, looking for wisdom for other sources other than the Bible. And God says that they become fools. Submit to the authority of God and you will get smart. You will have understanding, you will have godly wisdom, but reject it and you will become a fool. And so Romans 1, 21 to 22 says, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but they be, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools. Many of the occult religions of the world teach that you can become like God, or a God. This is the same lie Satan fooled himself with in Isaiah 14, 14, and it says there in Isaiah 14, verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That's the words of Satan. I will be like the Most High. We see Satan using that same lie on Adam and Eve, and they fell for it. And this is also Adam, Satan is back in the sound. Um, strategy, he challenges God's word. I think I missed a couple of bits of there out there. Okay, so let's have a look at what are Satan's four tactics or strategies Okay, we see happening here. He adds to God's word, he twists God's word. Number two, he challenges God's goodness. So we see there when he took out the words of, you know, when he said, has God said, you can't eat of every, you cannot eat of every tree. God didn't say that. God said you can eat of every and freely. So he adds and he twists God's word. He challenges God's goodness. So he made it seem as if God was holding something back and hiding something from them. He subtracts from God's word. We see that in verse 4 where God hasn't said you won't surely die. And he offers wisdom without submission to God. We see where did Adam and Eve go wrong? Four things. She subtracted, subtracted from God's word in verse 2. She added to God's word in verse 3. She doubted God's goodness in verse 2 and 3. And, of course, sadly, we see in the, in the, the fourth thing that went wrong there was Adam. Now, when I talk she, we're talking about Eve. But then we see Adam being a passive male. He did not take his place of headship, and he allowed this to happen. He allowed it to happen. He should have stepped in and said, no, this is wrong. God did not say that. This is what God said. Adam knew what God said. He was fully aware of what God said. And he never stepped in. Men, we need to stand. We need to be the priests in our homes. We need to stand for the word of God. We need to lead our homes, our wives and our families. That is one of our greatest callings. As a husband, as a father, and as a single man, you are still called to be a priest of God, to stand up for the truth of God's word and hold on to God's word and proclaim God's word. That's what we are called to do. We need to be in God's word and studying God's word and we need to understand God's word. And when we hear this stuff being done wrong, we need to stand up. We need to take a stand. And we need to treat our wife as a lesser vessel, but she's also equal with us in God. But we'll get more into that later. So, of course, I think we're going to end here for this week. And well, next week we're going to look at um, the beginning of sin, part two. What happens after this? We see, we know, well, the next verse is going to talk about how Adam and Eve ate and then what happened to them after that. You know, God wants us to understand his word. 
We see that often in churches today that Genesis is not being taught. The beginnings aren't taught. Well, I've spoken to so many people that have, that, that have come from into church, they've been a new Christian, they've been around church for a long time, but they don't even know Genesis. They don't even know about creation. They've still got evolution in their thought. And they don't understand. They believe in Jesus and they know they were sinners because that was what they were taught. But they don't understand where it came from and why. And they've still got this evolutionary, sometimes mindset about death before creation. And that starts to muck up their whole walk. And it's easy for the enemy to get in and deceive and, and, and people get twisted and, and lost along the way because they don't have a sure foundation. We don't have a good foundation in the word of God. And it's important that we do have that. I encourage you to read chapter 1, chapter 2 and chapter 3 before, my, before the next session and just read it over several times and ask God the Spirit to just open those things up because our whole understanding and what happens for the rest of the Bible is based on those things there. God bless. of God be with you, keep you and watch over you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen.